About a month ago, I noticed that someone suggested the somewhat unusual idea of doing a video on the player at each Premier League team who I think is most likely to become a war criminal. Make no mistake, I'm not ruling that out as a future video, but the suggestion reminded me of the former French international turned Nazi collaborator Alexander Villaplan, who I wrote an article about in 2016. I know Tifo Football have since made a video about Villa Plan in 2018, although it was fairly brief, so if enough of you are unaware, or just interested in learning more about the story of France's 1930 World Cup captain, then perhaps that could still be one for the future. There is another former European international accused of war crimes whose story, as far as I can tell, hasn't been told in many news outlets, and not at all on YouTube. This video is unlikely to make it onto YouTube's trending page, but I found it interesting, and I know a lot of you enjoy these types of videos, even if they don't attract the largest viewership. Hopefully, if nothing else, YouTube at least doesn't demonetize it. Before I start, I just want to apologize for the lack of images I'm able to provide along with my commentary, as is often the case with these types of videos, so you might be best treating this more like a podcast. Our story begins in the city of Tartu in 1911. Now the second largest city in Estonia, back in 1911, Tartu was just one of a number of cities in the Baltic region of the Russian Empire, six years before the Tsar would be overthrown and the Bolsheviks establish the Soviet Union. Our story begins here because this is the time and place in which Ewald Miksan was born. Amidst the chaos of early 20th century Estonia, as the nation seemed to be in a constant battle for independence, Miksan grew up with a passion for football. Estonia declared independence in 1918, but for the next two years they had to fight the Soviet Union to consolidate their independence before the Treaty of Tartu was signed in 1920. The Estonian national football team was founded in October 1920, losing 6-0 to Finland in their first game, but they soon found a place on the international stage with wins in the 1929 and 1931 Baltic Cups. In 1934, the same year in which Konstantin Patz effectively turned Estonia into a dictatorship, the nation appeared to have a new star on their hands. Ewald Mikson, the young goalkeeper from Tartu, made his international debut at the age of 22 in a friendly game against Lithuania, which Estonia drew one all. Mikson won a further six caps for Estonia, taking his overall tally to seven, with a growing reputation across Europe for his impressive reflexes and athleticism. Some in Estonia had nicknamed the young goalkeeper the man with a hundred hands, but having shown much promise, like so many young footballers across the continent, Mixon found his career interrupted by the Second World War. Estonia initially declared neutrality in World War II, but like most European nations, staying out of this conflict would prove to be impossible. The nation initially fell under the Soviet sphere of influence following the Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact before being invaded by the Red Army and swiftly and forcefully incorporated into the Soviet Union in August 1940. In June 1941, Germany invaded the Soviet Union and forced the Soviets out of Estonia. The Germans were initially welcomed by the Estonians, whose pro-independence Forest brothers fought alongside them in Estonia, as they were seen to be helping liberate Estonia from the Soviet Union. Of course, the Germans weren't in Estonia on a humanitarian mission, and goodwill towards the Germans would soon be tested. Conscription was almost immediately implemented, with Estonia suffering devastating casualties in the conflict, along with civilian deaths, as the Holocaust expanded to Estonia through the Einsatzgruppe death squads and also the implementation of concentration camps. Estonia went from having a population of 1,133,000 in 1938 to just 928,000 by 1946, a population drop of 18%. Many people were displaced, but at least 7.3% of Estonia's population are believed to have died during the war, which is among the highest percentage death tolls in Europe. The World War II death toll in the United Kingdom, by comparison, was 0.94% of Britain's overall population. In the late 1930s, playing football wasn't a particularly lucrative business in Estonia, even for a full international, An Estonia goalkeeper, Ewald Mikson, served in Estonia's police force alongside playing football. Once World War II began, and once Germany had occupied Estonia, the demand for footballers decreased, but the demand for police officers, who were loyal to the Third Reich, dramatically increased. Under German occupation, Estonia's police were brought under the wing of the Sicherheitspolizei, or Security Police, which combined the forces of both the Secret State Police, also known as the Gestapo, and the Kriminalpolizei, or Criminal Police. Under German influence, Ewald Mikson quickly rose to the rank of Deputy Chief of the Estonian Sicherheitspolizei in the Tallinn-Harju district. We know that for a fact. 
What there is some grey error regarding is how Mixon rose to such prominence, and what duties he carried out in order to court such favour from the Germans. In 1942 though, Mixon was himself imprisoned by the Germans, and he would be detained for between one and two years. By the time he was released, the whole complexion of the war had changed, and the Axis powers were losing ground as the Allied forces landed in Normandy, and the Soviets launched massive offences on the Eastern Front, securing a major victory in Belarus. Mixon, like so many who had helped the Germans during the war, could see that their race was run, and aware of how deputy police chief in a German-occupied nation may be viewed by the Soviets as they rapidly closed in on Estonia, he quickly sought to distance himself from his previous work. Fearing capture, the now 33-year-old former goalkeeper fled to Sweden, where he was imprisoned. In 1946, as many involved in the Axis war effort went on trial for war crimes, Mixon looked to flee to the safe haven of South America, boarding a ship set for Venezuela. His ship, which departed from the Norwegian coast at Halden, would never reach Venezuela though. It was stranded in Reykjavik, in Iceland, where Mixon would spend the rest of his life changing his name from Ewald Mixon to Edvald Hinrichsen and living until December 1993, aged 82. Mixon's two sons, Johannes Edvaldsen and Atli Edvaldsen, both became Icelandic internationals, and his granddaughter, Sif Atlodite, is a current international for the Icelandic women's national team. Johannes played as a centre-back, most famously for Celtic, where he was nicknamed Shuggy and made more than 150 appearances between 1975 and 1980, as well as winning over 30 caps for Iceland. Atli, who was seven years younger than Johannes, won even more caps than his brother and still ranks 20th in Iceland's list of all-time most caps players. As a midfielder, Atli played in Germany, Turkey and Iceland for the likes of Borussia Dortmund, Fortuna Dusseldorf and Jens Schleiberle winning 70 caps for Iceland and later managing the national team for four years. Mixon's granddaughter, Sifat Lodete, also ranks among the Icelandic women's team's most caps players of all time, with 80 caps to her name and counting, and the 34-year-old fullback plays her club football in Denmark. The story of Ewald Mixon, or Edvald Hinrichsen, is an incredible one, but it is one which offers more questions than answers. Just how involved Mixon was in German atrocities in Estonia was a topic of debate right up to, and indeed beyond his death, in 1993. Mixon, unsurprisingly, distanced himself from the worst crimes that occurred in Estonia during his time as deputy police chief, and in his biography, it is claimed that the reason he was imprisoned by the Germans was because he refused to share the details of witnesses to his superiors during interrogation, a claim that is repeated on the former goalkeeper's Wikipedia page. Under closer examination though, this claim looks to be more than a little suspect. A Swedish government report found documents that showed Mixon had been arrested along with his police chief in December 1941 for possession of suspected Jewish property. This was a common crime in Nazi Germany as Jews were stripped of all they owned and sent either to be killed, to do grueling work as slaves, or, as was so often the case, both. Whilst the Nazis had no problem seizing Jewish goods, they were to be seized on behalf of the German state, not pesky police officers. Mixon is reported to have been seen by his driver going into a Jewish jewellery shop and taking 28 kilograms of gold, which he claimed was for the Germans, but his driver alleged that Mixon kept 0.5 kilograms of gold for himself. According to a Swedish inventory, when Mixon arrived in Sweden having fled Estonia, he had multiple currencies and a single piece of gold in his possession. The files that the KGB gathered on Mixon alleged that he had served as a Gestapo investigator, that he had used several torture methods to get confessions out of people, and that he had worked at the Tartu concentration camp, perhaps even having carried out executions himself. These appear to be the most damning allegations made about Mixon, although a lot of them are corroborated by a Finnish agent who had spent time in Estonia under German occupation. According to the agent's reports, Mixon had boasted of how the Estonian police's torture methods, including beating suspects' heads against a wall, beatings against tender parts, and electric shocks, had, with the exception of just one case, made even the toughest of perpetrators talk. This agent's report also claimed that Mixon and other Estonian police told him that all male Jews in Tallinn had been shot, whilst many children had starved. Mixon, he alleged, also told him about a time in which his police had driven 80 Jews on a truck to a forest, had told them to kneel on the edge of a cliff, and shot them from behind. The Simon Wiesenthaler Center, renowned for their Nazi hunting and tracking down those accused of war crimes, identified Mixon as a person of interest. 
The director of the Simon Wiesenthal Center's Jerusalem office, Ephraim Zhurov, had long wanted to see Mix on stand trial for his alleged crimes, and he felt confident the former footballer was guilty based on all of the archives that he had been given access to. Zhurov was repeatedly rebuffed by Icelandic authorities, who he felt were all too quick to dismiss Mixon's past discretions. Mixon became a significant figure in Iceland's basketball scene following the end of World War II, and was even considered to be the father of Icelandic basketball by some. Given the influence Mixon, or Hinriksen as he was known to them, had on Icelandic sport through his work in basketball and his two sons' presence within the Icelandic national football team, Jorov felt the Icelandic press and authorities were unwilling to properly scrutinise his past. In 1992, by which stage Mixon was 81 years old and both of his sons had retired from international duty, the Icelandic government and state prosecutor decided to take into account all of the evidence that they had received from the Simon Wiesenthal Centre and Estonian archives, and launch a full investigation into Mixon. Before any charges were made or court dates arranged, Mixon died in Reykjavik in 1993, aged 82. In 1998, the President of the Republic of Estonia, Lennart Meri, announced the formation of the Estonian International Commission for the Investigation of Crimes Against Humanity, also known as the Max Jacobson Commission, which singled out the role of Mixon along with three others on account of all four signing numerous death warrants. Of course, Mixon had been dead for seven years and he always maintained his innocence. Undoubtedly, Ewald Mixon, and later Edvald Hinriksen, was a man of multiple lives. To some Estonians, he was a briefly brilliant goalkeeper for the national team. To others, he was considered a brutal police chief and even one who made life and death decisions. To Swedes, he was a fugitive. To Icelandics, a refugee, the metaphorical father of Icelandic basketball and the literal father of two of Iceland's best footballers. To many Jews, Mixon was a war criminal who evaded justice and got away with heinous crimes. That is it for today's video, which is a shady but fascinating story, which was painstaking to research, but revealing at every turn. Digging deeper into Mixon is like excavating some inexplicable ancient settlement. The more you dig, the more you find, but so often each discovery brings with it more questions than answers. If I had another day to research the story, I'd probably be able to tell you even more but I'm afraid I have to keep to a strict schedule and bring you a video every day, which is why I'm currently writing this script at one in the morning and dreadfully deprived of sleep, not having had a chance to play football manager or say hi to my girlfriend in more than a week. Nonetheless, I hope it was worth it and you all enjoyed the video. I hope YouTube don't demonetize it by virtue of some stupid algorithm. Thank you all for watching, hit the like button if you found anything entertaining or interesting about today's video, and make sure to subscribe to HITC7s to see, or more likely hear, more videos from me in the future.